Hey, welcome to the wind down episode number two. So welcome also to Digital Theologian. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael Hoff. I spent 13 years in pastoral ministry. I am currently working on a PhD in renewal theology at Regent University, and it has been the passion of my life to share theology, church history, and scripture with people who are wanting to go deeper in their walk with the Lord. So uh, the wind down, this is really just intended for you and I to connect uh, so these live streams are going to be uh, these live streams are going to be going on uh, pretty consistently uh, about once a week and uh, what I want you guys to be able to do is just connect with me I want to see if you're available you're in the chat go ahead leave a comment I'd uh, love to hear from you but my hope from the beginning with YouTube has been to connect with people one on one and I, I really want this to feel like uh, we're just a couple of friends sitting down together over a cup of coffee. So I'm still working out any audio and lighting issues. Uh, I'm really actually pretty new to live streaming. So uh, if you would, just let me know. How's it sound? How's it look? Uh, and if you have a video background and you want to give me any input on uh, how to make it better, always open to those suggestions. But uh, with this being the wind down, my hope is that this is a little more relaxed and that you and I uh, are just sitting down having some time together to talk about something that uh, I know people have questions on. And this goes back to today. I just want to talk to you about Basil of Caesarea and on the Holy Spirit. So uh, hopefully you've got some coffee. I'm going to take a drink of mine and we'll get rolling. All right. So with Basil... One of the key things that uh, it's important for us to be aware of with Basil is uh, that he was a bishop in the early church, and he was a third-generation Christian. So uh, his grandparents on either side of his family lived during a time when Domitian was persecuting the church. He had There was an, a Roman emperor who was more broadly persecuting the church really than uh, at any point up until then. And... Uh, Basil's ancestors refused to bend the knee and to to offer incense in honor of the worship of uh, the emperor as a means of worshiping that emperor. And so what happened is uh, for one set of Basil's grandparents, they had all their property confiscated. They end up living in exile for a while. Uh, they're they're hiding, uh, but they don't give up their Christian faith. They continue to confess the reality of who Jesus is, and they refuse to bend the knee to the emperor. Now, the other side of Basil's family, some of his grandparents actually gave up their lives in order to stay true to Jesus. So he had confessors and martyrs in his family up until this point. And Basil wasn't the oldest brother. He wasn't the oldest sibling. He had uh, both a brother and a sister who were older than him. Uh, and really, it, pretty famously, his sister Macrina who was named after one of his grandmothers. So we have Macrina the Older, who's the grandmother, or Macrina the Elder, and then Macrina the Younger, who is Basil's sister. And Macrina the Younger, uh, she gathers together this religious community, uh, some people on their family estate. Uh, Basil's family, his parents, uh, actually end up th really thriving, flourishing. And uh, as a result of that, they're able to have a home both in the city and out in the country. They're able to send uh, their children off to get good educations. And Basil is able to even to go to Athens and study in Athens and, and gain really one of the best educations, especially in philosophy, uh, that the world had to offer at the time. And so now, or at least the West had to offer at the time. And so Basil is, uh, is a highly educated individual, but Macrina, uh, his older sister, is uh, gathering people on their their family estate in the country, and she's really helping them pursue this intentional Christian life where they go deeper in their walk with the Lord, they're living in community, they're asking questions of what it means to be faithful disciples of Jesus and to kind of live that out uh, day in, day out in, in community with other believers. And 
when Basil first gets back from studying in Athens, he kind of he comes to the same family property, but he kind of goes off by himself a little bit, and he's he's a little bit reclusive. He's trying to you know perfect this um, more philosophical life. He's a Christian, but he's been influenced by philosophy, and he's he kind of adapts a posture where he's like, I'm going to go off on my own, and I'm going to have my own thoughts. I'm going to have my own spiritual life. And that is kind of the the model that uh, Basil initially is operating with. But then something happens. Basil uh, is connected with a mentor. His name is Eustathius of Sebaste. And so Basil has known Eustathius. He served as a bishop in the church in their area. He's been to the family home a number of times. And uh, as Basil's coming back, uh, you know, uh, from a from a trip, he's he hears that Eustathius has gone to Egypt to meet some of the early Egyptian monastics, uh, and so this was a time where uh, you've gone from the time of Basil's grandparents, where you have people who are being martyred, who are being forced to give up all of their property as they confess Jesus, and if, if they refuse to bend the knee to Caesar, to the emperor, uh, and then they go on. And, uh, you know, so this, the, by the generation really a few short years before, uh, Basil is, is becomes a bishop, uh, we have the emperor no longer persecuting Christians, but now the emperor is endorsing Christianity and makes it a, an official religion within the Christian, within the Roman empire. So you have Roman empire, uh, Roman emperors punishing, persecuting, hunting down Christians and and the extent to which they really hunted them down, uh, it was more of a in some places in some uh, occasions it was more of a kind of don't ask don't tell kind of scenario where uh, if people were neighbors would bring Christians uh, to a magistrate or to a judge for refusing to offer incense. Uh, you know, to the emperor, to honor the emperor, to worship the emperor, then, you know, at, at that point, they would be persecuted. But uh, by the time that Basil's alive, Christianity is a sanctioned religion within the Roman Empire. And so you've you've had the Council of Nicaea in 325, uh, and and there's been this, this marriage between the church and the state on some level. And now, where two generations before, it was a crime to be a Christian. Now there are people who have said, oh, wait, I can gain political and financial influence by joining the church and pursuing Christianity as a means of advancement. And so this is an interesting time that Basil lives in. You have some people who are wholeheartedly pursuing Christ and who are flourishing as a result of now having the freedom to be a public Christian, to be a Christian who worships, a Christian who confesses, and a Christian who doesn't have to fear their business being shut down, their property being taken away, or them losing their life as a result of being faithful to Christ and refusing to worship the emperor. And so there's this dynamic that's going on where you have people like Basil who are multiple generation Christians that have have the opportunity to flourish where women like Macrina can use the freedom that they have to gather people together, to gain influence, and to really make a difference in the lives of the people around them. Uh, because right, for Macrina and for those that gathered, uh, a lot of these, these Christians that were gathering, they're using the the influence that they have, the freedom that they have, to care for the poor, to minister to the sick. And uh, it's it's really you know, advancing a number of elements of of social good, of of ministry to the poor. Um, But you have some frustration with those who now see that because because the church is now in, in league with the emperor, in league with the empire, because politics in the church have been so blended, uh, they are walking away from cities. They're moving out into the country. They're distancing themselves in many ways from the established church to pursue a more rigorous lifestyle of Christianity. And so uh, you have the desert fathers and mothers that are emerging during this period. And they are people who are uh, truly trying to live a, a deep, devout spiritual life. And that flows out as they are 
uh, they're ha- having spiritual warfare. They're they're trying to bring their uh, their desires and their appetites that are not in line with Christ. They're trying to bring those back in line with the gospel, and they're living disciplined, rigorous lives of poverty out in the desert. And they're normally not doing that just by themselves or alone. It's even as people uh, like Saint Anthony, the one really the most famous of the early monks. Uh, Saint Anthony has to keep moving out farther and farther and farther into the desert. He starts not too far from the city, and then people come nearer, and so then he has to move farther out. And it just that kind of progression happens for a lot of these uh, these monastic figures, these early desert mothers and fathers. They're living such a holy life that people want to hear from them. They want them to pray for them, and uh, they have to go farther and farther, you know, until they get out into the desert to, you know, in the case of, of Antony, you know, like locking himself in an old fort and uh, trying to keep everybody away and people coming just to slide food under the door into him or him uh, responding to them uh, between a closed door because he doesn't want to be contaminated. He wants to be just him and Jesus. And well, there's a place for that. As Basil is traveling and experiencing some of what he he's seeing in, in Egyptian monasticism, uh, he never fully picks up that same kind of uh, of pattern, which is interesting because when he was on the family farm, it seemed like that was the direction that he might go. But coming back from Egypt, after never having caught up with Eustathius of Sebaste, his mentor that he was trying to go on this trip to find, uh, he never meets him. But he he still goes. He still travels through Egypt. He he still travels in a number to a number of holy places along the way, uh, seeing monastic communities, seeing individuals uh, living and trying to honor Jesus through their lifestyle and being more rigorous in their Christian faith, more disciplined in their Christian faith than than the average Christian during this time frame, and uh, and so as Basil comes back. Uh, to his family home, he then gets connected with uh, his sister and the group of people that are there. And from that point on, Basil lives a monastic life in many ways. But what he does is he gathers people together who aren't religious. You know, they're not in the Catholic sense. They're not priests. They're not nuns. But they are, they are people who are wholeheartedly devoted to Jesus, and they want to live a life that looks like what they see in Scripture and the early church. And so they devote themselves to the reading of Scripture, to prayer, to the breaking of bread together, and to worship. And so as they're doing these things, they start to care for the poor, they minister to the sick. It's, um, it's Basil is famous for starting the world's first hospital. First one, hospital number one. There were other places in the past before Basil where the sick were were maybe fed or they were prayed for at temples and shrines. But to bring the prayer and feeding and care for the, the sick together with medical treatment where they're trying to actually actively help people get better and to recover physically while at the same time praying for them and meeting their physical needs. Basil is the first historical example. So he sets up in in uh, Caesarea the very first hospital as a part of a monastic community, a place where the poor could be cared for, where where prayer and spiritual devotion were encouraged very strongly. And so and Basil has been highly influential throughout the history of the church, and he's a great example of what a, a true Christian looks like, of somebody who. And they're they're pursuing Jesus with all that they have. And while he may have been a little puffed up and pompous at the beginning, uh, Macrina, his sister, takes him down a few notches along the way. It's it's one of those great stories that we have recorded by uh, by the younger brother Gregory. Uh, so he who also goes on to be a highly influential bishop in the early church. So you've got Basil and uh, and Macrina and Gregory, all of whom are highly influential. Macrina really is the ringleader in many ways for this group. And the spiritual mentor. There, there are academic articles and books that have been written on how Macrina was Basil's mentor. And while somebody like Eustathius of Sebaste had influence and shaped Basil in his early years, ultimately Macrina was the one with the greatest 
influence. And that is demonstrated in his monasticism. It's demonstrated in his piety. So I, I just, I absolutely love seeing that, this family connection where women are empowered. Women are, are being led by the Spirit of God and are ministering to the close-knit groups that they are associated with. And much like Susanna Wesley for John Wesley uh, and Charles Wesley, centuries later, where a mother really shapes the spiritual life of two sons, possibly even more than their father, who was an Anglican priest. And here we have Macrina, the older sister, shaping the thought, the theology, and the spiritual practice of two brothers, Gregory and Basil, that both go on to become bishops and influential in their own right. And they're together known as, along with Gregory of Nazianzus, known as the Cappadocian Fathers. So you can just kind of tuck that away if you've never heard that term before. If you hear somebody talk about the Cappadocians, Basil is one of those figures, and he's often referred to as the key Cappadocian father. Um, but Basil helped us understand that the Holy Spirit is divine. The Holy Spirit is to be worshipped. And so I know I've been rambling here for a little bit, talking about Basil and his backstory. But the, the reason that Basil is so important is between 325 with the, the Council of Nicaea and 381 with the Council of Constantinople, where they reaffirm the Nicene Creed and expand our understanding. They expand significantly the language on the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's this time, this space, where... Uh, Basil is the key figure shaping the language of that confession. Now, I talked last week about Athanasius, and Athanasius was important, but ultimately it's Basil that gives us the language that provides the framework for what we see at the Council of Constantinople. And that confession is one that has been used in the church for almost 1,700 years. Uh, Man, I can't even imagine writing something that would be influential for a millennia and a half plus. I, I just can't even wrap my, my head around writing something that would be read 50 years from now or 100 years from now, let alone 1,700 years from now. It's incredible. Uh, but so Basil has has a massive impact on the church and continues to have influence as people read him, understand him, and look back on his life and his thought. And so if you ever want to just dive in, uh, I've actually included some links to uh, actually all of his works. You can buy uh, all of them on Kindle for like $2, right? Public domain, things that are old. You can get somebody that will repackage it for you for a couple of bucks and you can get it on Kindle. Or if you'd like, you can get kind of the, the scholarly edition for a handful of dollars more. And uh, those links are down in the description as well. But uh, one of the things that I love about On the Holy Spirit is as Basil talks about the Holy Spirit, the whole debate centers on the worship of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit uh, to be worshipped on the same level as the Father and the Son. And so Basil affirms that from the beginning. Uh, in, in chapter 2 of On the Holy Spirit, he's you know, chapter 1, he's kind of discussing when the, the appropriate place for theological discussion is, and, and he moves into chapter 2 and starts unpacking what... Uh, you know, what kind of language is appropriate to use referring to the Holy Spirit? And he talks about the doxology that he has used. And as he has used language of worship, uh, this confessional worship during, uh, you know, really during what he is doing as a priest in front of a church, in, tr in front of a group of believers, is he is giving glory to the Holy Spirit with the Father and with the Son. He's using with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit in the exact same way. He's viewing God as triune, and he's seeing that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are intimately connected. They are interconnected. What uh, The work of the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Holy Spirit point to the fact that the Holy Spirit is divine and that the Holy Spirit is worthy of worship and honor in the same way that the Father and Son are. And so what you see is a triune God, that you have God who is uh, three persons but one substance. And and so we get this kind of language that, that works its way throughout uh, Basil's writing, but it comes back so many times to worship and the sacraments. And for those of you that don't come from a sacramental background, uh, the sacraments are things like Baptism, uh, marriage, uh, 
you know, it depends on communion, the Eucharist, right? Uh, it depends on what your what church context you're in, as to how many sacraments there are, or whether you would even use the language of sacraments. But holy mysteries, these sacred moments, these sacred mysteries, where uh, where God is at work, and so baptism really is at kind of at the heart of what uh, Basil is getting at. He's like, look, in the language of worship, we see that the Holy Spirit is worthy of worship in the same way as the Father and the Spirit. And he goes on in as he describes baptism, and he says, we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the practice of the earliest Christians has been to demonstrate that the Holy Spirit, even if we don't fully understand how the Holy Spirit is divine and what it means for the Holy Spirit to be divine, we have consistently, through our church's practice and worship, demonstrated that the Holy Spirit is divine, that the Holy Spirit is in the same is to be mentioned in the same breath. That uh, in many ways, that the Holy Spirit, uh, we cannot know the Father apart from the revealing of the Holy Spirit, and that the Son, the work of the Son, is demonstrated through the Holy Spirit. That. The Father is the one who anoints, that the Son is the one who is anointed, and the Holy Spirit is the anointing. And so we have uh, this this kind of language that shows up. And and as Basil is trying to uh, navigate all of this, Eustathius, his former mentor, is leveling critiques against him, and he's doing it from a philosophical framework. He's doing it from uh, an Aristotelian or Platonic framework that's, uh, that is, it's saying that uh, there are things that are causes, there are things that are, uh, there is the cause, which is the father, there is the influence, which, uh, which is the, the, uh, the son, and there is the environment, which is the spirit. And and Basil says, look, you're using these philosophical categories rather than the language of scripture. And as you use these philosophical categories, they're leading you into error. You are uh, making dissections uh, between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that aren't present in Scripture. You are relegating the Holy Spirit to a created order. You're you're making the Holy Spirit a part of creation. And, and Basil really contends that you can't do that if you only use the language of Scripture. And like every early church father that you will read, Uh, Basil is immersed in the language of Scripture. And so, so much of what Basil is doing is quoting Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture in defense of his position. He is saturated in the Word of God. What he is saying flows out of a knowledge of Scripture. And even though the church is is barely, it's not even fully 300 years old or is around 300 years old uh, at this point, as he's writing this, it's just a little over 300. Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, it is just a few years over 300 at this point. And Basil is passing along the tradition that he has received. And so for him, it's it's like going back to 1 Corinthians 15, where we have this, this early confession of the church. Right? Basil has received teaching. As a third-generation Christian in his family, there are things that he has received as he has been a part of the church, as he has uh, received training, as he's been a, uh, as he is a priest and a bishop. He has received understanding. He has received an inherited tradition on who the Holy Spirit is and how God uh, works in the world. And, and so frequently, Basil brings this back to worship and that, that we are to worship the Holy Spirit. And Man, I, I love, I just want to read a, a couple of things to you guys as I'm pulling up my notes here, but uh, he's accusing his opponents of logic chopping and that they're dividing these uh, these prepositions and, and they're, they're trying to appeal to philosophy and he's just continually hitting them with scripture. And it gets to the point where this is really what I love is that Basil pulls them the, his reader back and says, Let's focus on who the Holy Spirit is, because as you do that, as you focus on who the Holy Spirit is, you are going to be brought into a place of giving the Holy Spirit glory as you contemplate what the Holy Spirit has done. And so he says this, he says, what are his works? 
They are unspeakable because of their greatness and unaccountable, un, sorry, uncountable because of their great number. For how will we know what is beyond the ages? How many gifts has he given to creation? What is his power in the ages to come? In truth, he existed and pre-existed and co-existed with the Father and the Son before the ages. And he goes on and he says, Should we not exalt him who is divine in nature, unbounded in greatness, powerful in his energies, and good in his deeds? Should we not glorify him? But I posit that glory is nothing other than the recounting of the wonders that belong to him. It is absolutely the case that the expression of his attributes is the fullest and greatest glorification. Come on. Like if you want to tell, if you want to worship God, tell who he is. If you want to, if you want to give glory to God, then tell what he has done. And this is one of the things that I, I really appreciate about being a part uh, of a charismatic church, a church that values uh, testimony, that we recognize that there is a place for recounting what the Holy Spirit has done and is doing in our midst. So as we tell the story to the people around us of what the Holy Spirit has done in us, through us, and for us, that we are inviting others into a worship encounter with the living Spirit of God. That as we recount who God is, as we tell others of what the Holy Spirit has done, we bring Him glory. And it's an opportunity and an invitation for people to then go on to worship the Holy Spirit as God, as divine. And and this this is the only proper response for us as we, we are brought into uh, the reality of who God is. Right, we, we have this amazing opportunity to worship the Lord and that as we recount who God is, as you share your testimony, as you share the stories of what God has done in you, through you, and throughout history. That's one of the reasons I love studying church history is because it's this consistent invitation for us to, ex to have our minds expanded on who God is and how he operates in the world. Because if all we have is our own personal experience and we don't look to scripture and we don't look to the history of the church, we have such a narrow view of what is possible. And when we, when we mine scripture and the history of the church for the riches of their, of their descriptions of who God is and what God does, man, we can go so much deeper. Our, our understandings are expanded and we can serve, honor, and worship God in ways that are consistent with the Bible and the history of the church, but may be a bit out of step with the culture in which we find ourselves. And that's okay. It's all right for us to be out of step with culture, especially in those times where we recognize that, man, God has done this before. And it's consistent with his character to do these things in our lives. How many are the works of the Holy Spirit? How great is this God that works in us and through us, the one who has promised to work all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes, the one that and that says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is on the inside of you, that the spirit of life, the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom, right? these are arguments Basil makes. He talks about the spirit of wisdom and life, the spirit of truth. right? This is, this is a Basil's argument and it brings it back that the Holy Spirit is divine. And that we as believers have the opportunity to experience the Holy Spirit and to go, uh, go deeper in our understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. There's one more quote I want to share with you, and then I'll, I'll quickly pray for us and, and we'll be on our way. All right, give me just a second to find it. All right. Here we go. Ah, uh, come on, Michael. When you have it in front of you for so long, and then you move it. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Ah, here we go. All right. Thanks for your patience. Basil says, the things that participate 
in the Holy Spirit, enjoy Him to the extent that their nature allows, not to the extent that His power allows. This is a call for believers to pursue holiness. The Spirit is known as holy. And we as believers have an invitation to experience the Holy Spirit. And the things that participate in the Holy Spirit enjoy Him to the extent that their nature allows, not to the extent that His power allows. His power is boundless. So this is an invitation for us to go deeper in holiness, to have our lives refined and purified by the grace of God, the working of God, and living in community with other believers that will challenge us to live more faithfully, to live out the gospel even more fully. And as we do that, we can enjoy and experience the power and the life of the Holy Spirit even more. So as you watch this, I pray that the Holy Spirit will meet you right where you are right now and that you would feel the grace of God just washing over you. God, I thank you that you forgive us for where we fall short of your standards. We ask that you would wash us clean now. Holy Spirit, we join with that ancient prayer of the church and we say, come. Come, Holy Spirit, with the goodness of who you are, with your life and your light, your peace and your grace. For those who are in need of comfort, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would draw near to them, that you would be their comforter. For those who who need to be lifted up and carried forward, that need someone to come alongside, God, I'm there. I I think that's, that's all of us in so many ways, God, that we invite you, paraclete, Holy Spirit, you are our help, our ever-present help in time of need, and we invite you to come and to, to work as you do in our lives. God, we ask that you would refine us, make us holy, purify us, that we could enjoy you even more to the extent, God, to the extent that our lives are in line with you, we can enjoy you. So Lord, I, I just ask that you would wash us, cleanse us, renew our minds, renew our hearts, and energize us by your strength and your power. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. But I, I just thank you guys for watching, for sticking around. Uh, these these weekly live streams will be happening. This is, uh, you know, I'm taking two classes this semester. Uh, I'm doing some video editing and things like that on the side. And life is full. And so rather than just not posting videos, I decided to give you guys raw live uncut, unedited videos. And so here we are together uh, with all of the mess of what uh, me learning how to live stream. I appreciate you guys being along for the ride. And thank you so much for watching. May God bless you. And I will see you again next week.